Welcome, everyone. My name is Dinda Elliott, and I'm Director of Programs at China Institute. We are so delighted tonight to welcome two of the smartest people I know to talk about China with the president of China Institute, James Heimowitz. So a few quick introductions before we start the conversation. Um, Elizabeth Economy is one of the most important scholars of contemporary China in the United States. She's currently serving as senior advisor to the Secretary of Commerce for China. Liz is on leave from Stanford University's Hoover Institution, where she's a senior fellow, and she was pre previously the CV Star Senior Fellow and Director of Asian Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations for more than a decade. Min Xinpei is professor of government at Claremont McKenna College and also one of the leading scholars of contemporary China in the United States. He is a non-resident senior fellow of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Prior to joining Claremont McKenna College in 2009, he was a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and served as its director of the China program from 2003 to 2008. He's the author of many acclaimed books on China's political system, including one he's working on now about China's surveillance state. So I bet you've all been watching or reading about the amazing performance of Eileen Gu, the Olympic free, freestyle skier who grew up in the US but chose to compete for China. So the world has changed a lot since the last time we watched the Olympics in Beijing in 2008. And this seems like a very good moment to look at the question of, you know, what is the world according to China? We've seen a global financial crisis, a trade war, the rise of nationalism in both the US and China, and on the China front, the rise of Xi Jinping, incredible economic growth, a flexing of muscles in the South China Seas, a crackdown on the Uyghur population in Xinjiang, and an assertion of central control over the former colony of Hong Kong. So this is sure to be a very, very interesting conversation this evening. I want to hand it over to James Heimowitz, president of China Institute. Over to you, James. Thank you so much, Dinda, um, for that introduction and for everything you did to put this together. Um, you just heard the introduction. We're in for a fascinating discussion this evening. Um, you know, I, I just thought I'd take a second. You know, um, as Dinda said, I'm the president of China Institute. Um, I went to China before it opened up to the West and lived there for about 33 years. And um, the world has changed, um, and the world continues to change. And for anybody who's interested in China, um, you need to have a look at, at, at Liz's book. Uh, at, at China Institute, for those of you who don't know us, we were founded in 1926 to help Americans better understand China through its culture, through its language, through its business practices. And we believe that the, the future of the planet is actually a, a shared future. Um, but the only way that we can sort of have a, have a better and a brighter future um, is with engagement and trying to understand a little bit more deeply um, what the other, the other side is thinking and how they're thinking. So I can't think of a, a better way to start off than to ask um, Elizabeth and Minshin to, to turn on their cameras and to join us and to first maybe turn it over to Elizabeth. And if you haven't seen it, I just wanna put a quick plug up. The World According to China, I've just been reading it. Um, it's really thought provoking. Doesn't matter if you're a China expert or you're a novice, um, it's really important for you to have an understanding, um, and this is really enlightening. So I thought maybe we just start off today, and maybe Liz, you could start us off with a couple minutes and let us know from your perspective, what does the world according to China actually look like now? Um, so sure, James, thank you very much, um, both to you and to Dinda for hosting me and uh, Minchin for this conversation. Minchin, why don't you show your face? Where are you? <laughs> so so um, here yeah. I am. Um, so, so anyhow, it's it's great to, it's great to be here um, uh, back uh, at least virtually uh, at the China Institute, um, which is a terrific organization, and um, just to share a few thoughts about about my book and about actually what both Minchin and I are, are thinking uh, about what's going on in China today. So, you know, look, I, I wrote the book in part um, because when uh, Donald Trump was in power uh, in the United States. There was a lot of discussion uh, as he was pulling the United States out of, you know, a number of international organizations and agreements. Um, there was a lot of discussion that China would uh, step into the vacuum and that China would become sort of the, the dominant global power and would be would bear the burden, the responsibilities of, of leading the world. Um, Xi Jinping talked a lot about leading on global climate change, a lot about globalization. 
um, you know, second largest economy in the world, the largest military, you know, a lot of the pieces seem to be in place. And I just thought to myself, is, is that what China is, um, is aiming for? Is that what China wants? What are China's ambitions? You know, what is it that, that China wants? What is it that Xi Jinping wants? And so that's really what sort of prompted me to even think about um, writing another book. And, um, and as I began to, to explore sort of, you know, what Xi Jinping was saying about uh, China's position on, on the world, where he wanted to take the country and the kinds of actions uh, that I saw China uh, pursuing on the global stage, I, I, I kind of, kind of all the pieces of the puzzle came together in, in and formed a picture for me of, of a world that was really transformed and not reformed around the margins. You know, we used to say back in the old days when Minchin and I were starting out, you know, is China going to be, I think it was Sam Kim, you know, is China going to be a system maintainer or reformer or revolutionary? And, um, and a lot of people argue, you know, China would maintain the system because it had benefited from the system for so long. Why, why would it transform it? But, but actually China's changed a lot over the past 40 years. And I think what I've taken away from my research is that it wants the rest of the world to change along with it uh, in ways that align with China's values and you know, policy preferences and, and normative preferences. So I'll just quickly sort of sketch out, I think, um, you know, the five dimensions that I see uh, as, as in the process of being transformed. Um, uh, so first is really Xi Jinping attempting to just redraw the very geography of China, right? By reclaiming what uh, he considers to be, uh, you know, China's sovereign territory. And obviously we've already seen what happened to Hong Kong. We've seen uh, China press aggressively in the South China Sea is in dimension. Um, we had the border conflict with India, uh, the first deadly border conflict in 40 years. China's even, you know, claimed, politically claimed area in Bhutan. We have Taiwan sitting out there, I think is one of the truly um, uh, sort of most challenging issues that we're, we're facing in terms of the relationship with China right now. Um, and, you know, pressing forward on Diaoyu, Senkaku Islands with Japan. So all of these sort of contested territories and, and areas that uh, Xi Jinping, I think, wants to bring back uh, or bring into uh, sort of mainland uh, territory. Um, so that's the first, I think, significant, um, you know, push by Xi Jinping to transform the world around him. Second, I think, is just pushing the United States out as the dominant power in the Asia Pacific. And I think we've heard, you know, repeatedly, you know, Asia is for Asians to govern. Um, and I don't think he means Asia is for Japan to govern. <laughs> I think he means Asia is for China to lead. Um, and so I think, you know, whether we're talking about new organizations that China's putting in place, regional, you know, economic ones, military efforts, I think um, it's clear that uh, Xi Jinping believes that, you know, the United States uh, should no longer be the dominant power uh, in the Asia Pacific. Um, the third, I think, is just China's efforts to, to you know, spread its influence, right, uh, to embed uh, you know, its interests, its values, its policy preferences uh, in other countries to have them align their policies with those of China. It does this through the Belt and Road Initiative. I think it does it through more coercive uh, actions, um, you know, trying to uh, coerce companies and, and countries into recognizing Chinese preferences, whether that's around the sovereignty claims or it's trying to force Australia, you know, not to call for investigation into the origins of COVID. Um, I think, you know, China, again, is a very powerful country and wants the rest of the world to, to uh, support its interests and values. Nothing surprising here, quite frankly. Um, fourth, and I think this is something that's still in play in, in some respects, and I, I'm, I'm watching how it, it's emerging. And, and that's, I think, an effort by, by China, beginning with Made in China 2025, uh, and then expanding into the dual circulation um, theory this idea that China can manu you know, innovate, manufacture, and consume within itself, right? That, that China can be a much more self-sufficient economy, still export, still import needed capital and, and know-how, but be very selective about that engagement with uh, the rest of the world. Um, and I think that's something that I, I, I'm watching and it's quite interesting. It began in the technology sphere, but clearly we've seen more calls for agricultural and energy self-sufficiency, you know, hearkening back to the kinds of things we heard decades ago, uh, but also, you know, pressing forward to say, you know, Chinese firms should dominate in areas like pharmaceuticals and culture and tourism and sports, et cetera. So I think, I think a change is underway in terms of China's 
broader engagement uh, economically with the rest of the world. And then the last um, big shift uh, that I see is China's growing role and assertiveness in global governance institutions. And, and one of the things that I really found interesting as I you know, thought conceptually about you know, what I was seeing come out of my research is just that you have China's norms and values and policy preferences domestically. And you can see China pushing them out, you know, again, through the Belt and Road, right? Could be political, military, its first military logistics space, economically. And then you see China reinforcing those same values and norms around things like human rights or could be technical standards um, or internet governance in global governance institutions, right? In, in you know, parts of the United Nations, for example. Uh, and so it's like a, it's a, like a multi-level game almost. Um, and so it's taking domestic things, pushing them out, and then trying to cement them. Uh, and I think it, if China succeeds, it will be a world that is radically transformed, uh, particularly around issues like human rights and, and internet governance. Um, so I'll stop there, uh, but that's basically the, the narrative of the book. Well, well, we'll delve into it a little bit. I just want to take care of a little bit of administrative stuff and then um, turn it over to Min Shin for a second. And that is, we'll be here for about an hour. We're gonna, um, we've heard some opening marks from Liz. I'm gonna then turn it over to Min Shin. If you're interested as you hear things and would like to ask a question, please raise your hand, type it into the chat box. And um, after uh, Min Shin speaks, I'm gonna start off with a couple of questions and then we'll turn it over because I know um, you, you all are interested in asking questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as we, as we can. So thank you for that, Liz. I think that if anybody wants to have a more in-depth thing on any of the one of the five areas, I hope to touch on them myself, but they have to do the read. I wanna say something. Um, I got the book just the day before yesterday because it was on back order. I couldn't put it down. So on everything else, Liz, you're a great, you're a great writer and it's a pleasure and a joy to actually read, um, to read the book itself, um, not only because of the content, but the way it's written, it's, it's a delight. So, um, so Minchin, and, and I said, you, you people in the audience, just re, um, raise your hand and type in the chat thing and I'll get to them as we, after my questions. So Minchin, how does that sound to you? Is, is the world according to China, are we gonna be, you know, if I listen to the China narrative and I, I read the Chinese press as well as the English press, and I think, you know, we're all headed to a happy future because um, China's got it right. And um, if the world sort of falls into shape and we've got now a balancing power for the hegemony of the United States, maybe the planet's headed in a better direction if we're, um, you know, as China takes a greater role. And I'm curious what you might think about that. Well, in direct response to your question, I would say that uh, we have to make a distinction between the world according to Xi Jinping and the world according to China. And these are two different things. I think in the same way that the world according to Donald Trump and the world according to America, these two are very, very different things. So uh, uh, I would try to, to take a step at that. Uh, I think uh, at, at the moment, the world is headed in a very dreadful direction. Uh, we can come back to that later on, but I want to, really say something about how good the book is. Uh, most academics really cannot write, <laughs> myself included. And this book is uh, really very elegantly written, uh, tells a very good story with a lot of details that are actually very revealing. Uh, a lot of uh, most re uh, sort of people who work in academia are much more interested in writing for their colleagues. Uh, not many of them actually bother to write for a general audience. And as a professor in an undergraduate college, uh, the people they serve least well are undergraduates uh, because the, their books on Chinese foreign policy, domestic policy uh, are not suitable for undergraduate education. Uh, but Liz's book is going to be, Liz's book is going to be a textbook in the future because, uh, because if you want to know about Chinese foreign policy under Xi Jinping, you cannot find a better book. That's, uh, so now let me just uh, make, try to make three points very quickly. That is, uh, uh, what really does she want? What's, what is the vision driving Xi's foreign policy for the last nine years? And the second point I want, sec set of point I want to make is that, uh, has he actually uh, been successful? Uh, and the third is that what now? Because obviously, there's a lot of pushback. So is he still sticking to the same playbook or are we going to see some uh, quite significant adjustments? 
Uh, so in terms of Xi's vision and his motivation uh, and his objectives is that uh, he clearly wants to expand China's global influence uh, and uh, consolidate its preeminence in East Asia, even at the risk of confrontation with uh, the US and its allies. Uh, the difference between Xi and his predecessors is that his predecessors probably had the same idea, same motivations, but they were uh, deterred by the risks that those actions would entail. Uh, but uh, she was not that kind of person. Uh, he was willing to take the risks. And he also saw that China was strong enough uh, to confront the US, uh, uh, even if uh, confrontation should happen. The other uh, objective, uh, he also believes, strongly believes, and I uh, think that those objectives are legitimate. He sees the US having very little business in China. You, know, you look at Chinese foreign uh, ministry spokesman, you are 7,000 miles away. Why are you here? Uh, so that reflects, I think, uh, a, uh, a kind of mindset uh, quite uh, prevalent among Chinese uh, elites. And he thinks that uh, the US, uh, it's in US interest to accommodate rather than confront China over these issues. His vision of China is a traditional great power with spheres of influence. Uh, he's not uh, into, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, rule-based system. Uh, uh, I think you should be struck by what Le Yuchen, the uh, number two guy in the foreign ministry said, uh, you guys, uh, he talked about the US, your rule-based system is really a loincloth clause for the law of the jungle because you set the rules, you have the power to change the rules. And I think that reflects uh, Chinese elite mindset as well. So it, because they just want to be, uh, they, they want to be great power not because, uh, just uh, simply because the great power can get its way. And uh, lastly, I would say that uh, while she's vision, values and motivations resonate with a great deal of Chinese people, there are different voices in China. There are a lot of doubts raised about many elements of his foreign policy, about the wisdom of such a strategy. Uh, of course, unfortunately, uh, in that kind of system, uh, doubts cannot be translated into opposition or into uh, policy. So this is the first part. Second part is that we have to uh, take a step back and look at what Xi's foreign policy has brought us and brought China and brought to him. Uh, I would say that in all likelihood, uh, he has not foreseen how his policy would have uh, been received in the West, in particular in the US. He uh, overlooked, if not uh, discounted or underestimated the vigor with which the US would push back. So that was, uh, that came as a uh, uh, great surprise. And second, I think he probably overestimated the shift in the balance of power in favor of China. He thought China was strong enough to contest uh, the US influence, uh, but the, uh, when the US began to push back, especially in the technology area, China's weaknesses were exposed very overnight, very quickly, very clear. Uh, the sanctions are uh, initially on, uh, uh, this uh, the, uh, 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 on Huawei and on other Chinese technology uh, companies. And uh, also I think uh, uh, there is an overestimation of Chinese power in terms of its ability to get things done beyond its borders. And BRI, the problem with BRI is another illustration. And lastly, uh, uh, there is a gap of understanding between the world as is and the world he wants <laughs> or China wants. That is the world China wants, which is restoration of great power spheres of influence. It's not a world that other countries would like to see. The world has moved on. Uh, 19th century vision of great power is not something that resonates. So when you try to behave like 19th century great power, you actually uh, get 
opposite results. Instead of get submission, get compliance, uh, you're going to get resistance. And Australia is the most revealing or most illustrative uh, example. Uh, so now what is China about to do? Because uh, the world uh, has sent out a very loud and clear message. Uh, the world you want is not the world we want. Uh, so I would say we should see a period of uh, I think the Chinese leadership actually gets it. <laughs> uh, this is a government staffed with a lot of well-informed, smart people. I think its policy process, policy making process, is very problematic at this moment. Overly centralized uh, uh, policy uh, making process. But I think they, uh, the leadership uh, uh, now gets the message. Uh, so we should see a period of significant adjustment, but mostly at the tactical level. And the Chinese objectives will remain the same but Chinese tactics will be quite different. Uh, they will shift their uh, focus. Their focus will be just like the US. The US is focused on China and China's focus is on the US. So you will have see redeployment of resources, energy and attention away from second tier, third tier projects to counter the US and China is going to play a long game. So in the short term, you, uh, you will see probably a period of consolidation of gains. China has already pocketed, but no more new initiatives. Uh, and uh, finally, there will be, uh, uh, the, uh, they know the winning party, the winning belligerent in this uh, confrontation is the one who gets its home front, uh, who wins on the home front. So they are now focusing a lot more on security and resilience, what Liz has just said is very, very true. That is, China is focusing on decoupling on its own terms, uh, even at the cost of uh, integration and efficiency. Uh, you, you and mentioned, I just wonder, because I just wanted to latch on to one thing you said, you know, and it's this theme about talking internally to a domestic audience and facing externally, and how much those external actions are um, really directed at, at a domestic audience because what i've heard you and liz say so far you know the chinese narrative looks like something like we're a proud and glorious nation we deserve to have some influence on the world platform and i think that thank you very much most of my of the country in china sees sees the policies that have been put in place over the last broadly two generations as extremely effective extremely successful and deserve to be heard on the global platform. But what we've heard you say is actually, well, the global plat global other countries aren't really interested in the success formula. Um, and I wonder if there's if there's any truth into that. Um, how much, you know, how much so, so you're basically saying the Chinese success model is not exportable. Is that right? Oh yeah, yeah. That's uh that's a, one thing I would like to say, but uh I think what I really would like to say is that some of the things that Beijing has done under Xi Jinping do appeal to the Chinese people, as these are things mostly around China, that Chinese, the Chinese public uh, shares the view that China is the great power in the region and the glory of its imperial times uh, should be restored. Uh, uh, but the Chinese public is also very skeptical about those far-flung ventures. If you look at, uh, Chinese coverage, Chinese press about Chinese projects overseas, they're very uh, sparse. The Chinese, that's one interesting thing about Chinese e efforts in Africa, in Latin America, in the Balkans, the Chinese government doesn't want to talk about them at home because they are highly, highly unpopular. Uh, so whether it's a, uh, China's success in the last, economic success in the last 40 years can be repeated outside, I've been a consistent, uh, Skeptic. I think they've got to uh, import not Chinese knowledge, but to import the Communist Party of China. And a few countries would like to go down that path. Well, let me change just a little bit because we're actually in the middle of the Olympics. Um, I remember my own professional career. I helped spearhead the international PR for the 2008 Beijing Olympics uh, when I worked for an international PR agency. The world has changed a lot. And if nothing else, Olympics are highly symbolic. It's a source of, you know, it, it, the messaging there is both, you know, obvious and subtle. And 
you know, the Biden administration has taken the position that we're going to boycott, at least symbolically. So I, I, I want to turn this over to Liz and ask you to Liz, you know, do you think that um, this boycott of the Olympics is the was the right decision? Do you think that it's been, you know, is, who's the audience? Is If we're going to boycott the Olympics, is the audience, are we trying to speak to Chinese domestic audience, Chinese government, or a U.S. domestic audience to satisfy the, the desire to punish China? Um, so first, I, you know, one thing I did forget to say is that um, I am, you know, speaking uh, tonight in my uh, personal capacity um, and not in any way, shape, or form uh, as uh, as a representative of the Biden administration. So, um, look, I think um, that I think the boycott, um, you know, represents uh, an assessment uh, by the U.S. government that um, a country that you know, is, you know, imprisoning, you know, more than a million of its own citizens in labor and re-education camps doesn't really represent the spirit of the Olympics. Um, and that's why there's a diplomatic boycott. At the same time, um, we don't want to deprive our athletes of the opportunity to compete. This is something that they have, you know, undertaken for, you know, the, their lives. They've spent their lives training in many instances for precisely this type of moment. And, you know, we don't want to, to, to not, you know, permit them uh, that moment. Um, and so uh, I think it's not, a, it's not a difficult thing to understand, James. I mean, I think it's fairly straightforward. And, um, you know, there were promises made in the 2008 Olympics um, that weren't actually uh, lived up to. And, you know, from my perspective, to be 100% honest here, they should never have received these Olympics. Um, and, uh, you know, now the Olympics Committee has put in place, you know, human rights uh, considerations uh, for future Olympics, uh, but somehow that didn't happen uh, in this instance. And so, you know, that's my personal opinion on, on you know, on and this actually issue. My personal opinion on this, Liz, is, you know, that was the right time to discuss it was before the Olympics were awarded. But I, I wonder, and I listen to the, to the message that we give and say, okay, do you think this resonates with the people of China? The US is saying we're boycotting and how does that message get received in China um, by, the, by the people there? I mean, look, James, we, we, we brought together with you know, 40, 50 other countries, resolutions to censure China in the United Nations three years running over what's going on in Xinjiang. We have, um, you know, now put in place uh, restrictions um, on our companies in terms of sourcing products uh, from Xinjiang. So I think that there is a deep-seated commitment, right, in this administration, and frankly, even in the previous administration, uh, to to recognizing that what is going on inside China right now is wrong. It is appalling, uh, and that a great country like China aspires to be, right, should not be treating its own citizens in this way. It, again, this is not to say the United States is perfect, right? This is, not, this is not the point here, but it is to say that what's going on there needs, there needs to be attention called to this issue. And, and so diplomatic, the diplomatic approach is the right approach. Punishing the athletes would not be the right approach. That would have been an alternative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Well, it, it's interesting you touched on one thing and that says, well, you know, my fear actually, and I'd like to, to you, both of you to comment on this is that, um, you know, America used to be seen as a beacon, an aspirational beacon that people wanted to, to, to admire, you know, to be a part of our, of our way of life. And I think somehow I'd like to ask if you agree, we've lost touch with our ability to connect at a human level with the people of China and vice versa and that we're all talking in echo chambers. Now, this is a global phenomenon, but it's particularly acute when it comes to China. And are we gonna be able to reconnect if we can't establish US as a beacon? Well, let me, say, let me say one thing quickly on this. But look, absolutely, we have our own work to do in terms of restoring you know, what has made the United States traditionally a great country. And we have a polarized society. We have many rifts throughout our society that we need to heal. Um, and that's, that is our work domestically that we need to do. 
in terms of, of um, whether or not you know, we, we can communicate with the Chinese people, I will point out the fact that you know, in 2017, China passed a law that restricted the ability of foreign non-governmental organizations to engage in China. It took the number of foreign NGOs that were working on things like poverty alleviation, environmental protection, migrant you know, children education, it took them from over 7,000 to about 400 odd NGOs. So, you know, it's, it's Xi Jinping and, and looking at the restrictions that he's placed on Western culture coming into China, right? Western ideas, not just Western, foreign ideas, right? If we're looking for where that process of intellectual and, and cultural decoupling has occurred, it's occurred in China first, right? So I, I think, but that's a really important point to understand is that, in fact, Xi Jinping has not demonstrated very much interest or desire in greater civil society engagement uh, with the United States. I think that's really critical to understand. This is a fundamental shift, uh, you know, from the pre-Xi period. Okay. Um, I think maybe at this point, um, you know, I've, I've opened up some of the some of the questions, and I'll come back and have my own. But I do want to give our audience a chance to chime in, and then I might come back again. Um, uh, rather than uh, call on them, um, I'll just read out some of them. Um, or uh, Jackie um, Metziani was asking; she raised her hand and she says, "Does China face key man risk with Xi Jinping?" If something happens to him, what would be a transition to new leadership? And how does that look like under a Chinese system? Yeah. Would you like well, to take that mission? <clears throat> oh, yeah, uh, certainly. I think any system with one strong man faces such a risk. Well, you can ask the same question about a lot of countries, uh, Russia, for example. Uh, and in the case of China, actually, they don't have a good succession system. That is, uh, the VP, the vice president of the country is not a member of the Parliamentary Standing Committee. And in the Chinese Communist Party's uh, party charter, there is no provision about who should succeed uh, the general secretary. If the general secretary is removed or somehow is unable to continue in office. So I think procedurally speaking, China has a much more serious problem than other countries in terms of dealing with uh, the potential incapacitation of its top leadership. Uh, and of course, uh, institutionally speaking, that kind of system always has uh, huge challenges in terms of succession. Thank you. Um, another, another question that's come up here. Um, do, do you think that um, China has succeeded with its narrative that Western style democracy um, is no longer, um, isn't, isn't right for China. Me, it's or... you mean with the Chinese people? Yes. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I just got handed today a report from CSIS and I haven't had a chance to read it yet. <laughs> but, it, it, but from what I've heard from one of the, the authors, um, it suggests that that is not the case, actually, that there is sub some substantial discontent with, um, with you know, China's current governance system. It doesn't mean that Western style democracy is necessarily what they what they're aiming for, but and, and you know, but but that um, but that there's more dissent within China than many people uh, and more discontent uh, with the way that Xi Jinping has moved the country than uh, people would maybe assume. Right. Just because you can't see it. It uh, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And this is based on polling data and stuff. And I'm really sorry that I haven't actually read the report yet. I just got it this morning. I don't know whether you've seen it mentioned yet or not. Yeah, no, I'm not seeing it. But I think uh, uh, we've been trying to answer this question uh, for a long, long time. Uh, the correct answer is that it depends on the time frame. That is, uh, it depends on how the Western democracies are performing uh, and how the Chinese system is performing. In the 1980s, there was no question that a lot of Chinese thought democracy was the future uh, because China was not doing well uh, and Western democracies were doing very well. I think during the pandemic, you might see a dip in public, public opinion about the efficacy of democracy and some kind of um, uh, uptick for the Chinese system. Uh, so these things, just if you look at 
uh, polling data, uh, it fluctuates. Uh, but I think what is really needed is an open, honest discussion and debate. In the case of China, we cannot have that kind of debate. So the real answer is that we don't know. <laughs> but I'm personally very skeptical that you can sell the Chinese public a version of history, a version of politics without allowing them to say anything. Right. Okay. Um, you know, I was having a little technical difficulty. I was hoping that I can open it up. I mean, we're about 150 people here, but I still think it would be nice to let people ask their questions themselves rather than me have to read them to you. So I'm going to try to see if I can answer um, as the questions are popping up. I see that Jeffrey Tao um, has come up with a question. And if you're there, you can turn off your mic, Jeffrey, and ask yourself. Yep, I think you got it. Okay, if that's Jeffrey, can you unmute? Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. Well, according to polls, 66% of Americans dislike China. And do they make a distinction between, in their dislike, between the government and the people of China? And if they're still, relatively uh, uh, okay with the people of China, what are the kinds of ways that uh, people to people, intellectual, academic, scientific, uh, and cultural uh, uh, cooperation can be fostered between the two peoples? Thank you. Who'd like to take that? Yeah. Uh, well, I blame the polling the firm because they should ask two separate questions together. Do you like the Chinese government? Do you like the Chinese people? I think that that way you can get a lot more uh, accurate answers. Uh, but this is all academic. I think uh, that is in terms of policy, you really cannot come up with a policy that targets the government without affecting its people. Uh, so, uh, the polling reflects a kind of sentiment in the US that China is not well, well liked, uh, whether it's people or it's government. But for the US government, uh, it has to devise policy. You, it's not like surgery, performing surgery. You can just take out something without touching others. Poli foreign policy is a very blunt instrument. If you ban Huawei's access to chips, my uh, uh, your friends, uh, your uh, family members in China are not going to get hold of Huawei uh, handsets. So that's it, uh, that's quite simple. But but let's think about you know the the engagement and interchange at a very practical level. Both sides have closed down. It's difficult to get visas. Collaboration has been you know hampered. So I think what what was being asked is where can we look for areas that we can um, you know see better progress about connect connecting whether you're in academia, whether you're in business, whether you're acting in NGOs, where can we look for a way to, to increase engagement? Look, I, I think it's, it's hard, James, and in part, frankly, it's hard for the reasons that I already mentioned, which is that I think that um, China, let's call it Xi Jinping, um, isn't that interested in fostering greater cultural and intellectual uh, exchange, an academic exchange. I mean, I think the number of visas that was granted to, um, to Chinese students to come to the United States has now returned to normal um, uh, this, for this year. So I don't think that the, the challenge is actually on, on our end uh, in this regard, right? We're, we're back up to the, to the levels that we were before uh, pre-COVID. I mean, the number of foreigners living in, in uh, Beijing and Shanghai has dropped by half you know, in the past few years. I think still, and interestingly, still in, in Guangzhou, the number is roughly the same, which we should maybe do a, a try to understand what's different from one city to the next. I'm sure we could have our theories on that. But, um, but I, don't, I don't know that, 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 you know, Xi Jinping is creating a welcoming environment, right, for that kind of exchange. Um, he's I mean, definitely I not. Tell, he's definitely yeah. not, Liz. The question is, given the fact that he's not doing that, where does that leave us and what can we do um, you know, to, 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 to live in that world? Do we just give up and say, okay, we'll live in our separate, separate worlds? 
No, I mean, I think what we're doing is still welcoming, you know, Chinese to come here, right? I mean, we're still welcoming Chinese students to come here, but it's obviously not as fruitful to have a one-way exchange uh, in, in that regard. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think we can push, we can push for the, you know, Fulbright program to come back. Um, uh, we can, you know, try to push for more foreign NGOs to be accepted in China. Uh, we can, you know, push for uh, Beijing not to, you know, uh, stop televising NBA games because one, you know, general manager of one team tweeted, fight for freedom, stand for Hong Kong, uh, you know, um, we can push for all those things. Uh, the question is, what is going to be the response? Um, and, and, and is there an appetite? I could ask Minchin, you work with American students directly now. Is there a curiosity and appetite? If we listen to what Liz says, are Americans going to want to take up and go to China? Are they as curious about China as Chinese have been about America for the past? Uh, I, uh, again, uh, I only deal with a small number of students. Uh, the interest in learning about China is very strong. Uh, but of course, right now we're talking about COVID. And then you look at a lot of problems uh, in terms of uh, getting access to people in China, worrying about one thing that is uh, access to the internet if you're in China. So there are a lot of practical problems that make China a much less attractive place for American students and American academics to go. And I completely agree with Liz that is that the US can do certain things. And I think the US should do them. For example, you should uh, unilaterally uh, say that we are going to allow the Peace Corps, resurrect the Peace Corps program. We're going to let the Fulbright program resume its uh, activities in China, but these are very limited things. The Mo China can do a lot more, letting journalists in. Today, we know so little about what's going on in China because China has kicked out so many American journalists and these are really good professional people. Uh, and we, uh, uh, we're not getting the right kind of information about China. So uh, China needs to do most of the heavy lifting. Uh, the responsibility is squarely over there. Okay, let me open up. By the way, I was gonna ask um, people to introduce themselves um, before they um, ask their question. I've just opened it up to um, our trustee, Pete Walker. Um, Pete, if you can come on and um, raise your question. I can see you're coming on there, great. Uh, just unmute and go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I, I had uh, actually two questions. One is, you know, having watched the meeting in Anchorage, where we started with the U.S. basically lecturing China on Xinjiang, um, and, you know, the Chinese, to me, not surprisingly, pushed back on the issue of the U.S.'s treatment of Blacks, which goes back, obviously, centuries. Um, and, you know, I just wonder if, if there isn't a feeling that the U.S. is being hypocritical a bit on this issue. It's one thing to say that we recognize the problem, but the reality is the treatment of the Blacks has been going on for so many centuries, and the progress and the examples we see every day basically say that we are not as a country taking it seriously. So are we credible when we basically single out China on this dimension. And by the way, I, I totally oppose what's happened in Xinjiang. I think it's not the right thing to do, but I just question our legitimacy in, in standing above, you know, outside, outside on that issue. Yeah. You want? Uh, I, I guess I would just say, look, I, I don't really think that the situations are, are parallel. I mean, and yeah. we could go into a much deeper <laughs> conversation about how yeah. vastly they actually differ. Um, you know, I'm, I'm open to having China criticize the United States, right? I don't, the United States doesn't then go and, and censure the, the people who criticize it, right? And, and so I think, you know, Fine, the Chinese can criticize the United States, as I think Tony Blinken, I think it was Tony said, right, you know, we recognize, admit publicly our failings, and then try to work to address them imperfect, imperfectly, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, but, but China doesn't actually acknowledge what it's doing in Xinjiang, 
certainly is not working to rectify the problem. Uh, and I think those are two, you know, pretty big differences uh, in, in sort of how we are trying to manage the problems here. Uh, so it, putting aside how vastly different they are. But again, I, I try not to, um, you know, people, when I used to work on the environment a lot in China and, and Sometimes students would ask me, well, how can you criticize China's environment when we're, we're not perfect? I'm like, of course, that's true. And, and we can criticize ourselves too, but we're talking about China and what, you know, and what China is doing right now. Um, and so, and the last point I'll make is that it's not just the United States that is critical of what's going on in Xinjiang, right? There are many democracies. Oh, yeah. uh, you could argue are better situated and more legitimate, perhaps, if that's how you want to put it. To, to stand up and, 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 and who've stood up at the United Nations and criticized China for what it's doing in, in Xinjiang. Did you want to quickly ask your second question, Pete? Yeah, the other question, you know, ha having made over 80 trips to China over the last 15 years and spending a lot of time with Chinese students in the US, I, I am always consistently hearing basically that they admire what the government has accomplished they believe it's a very effective meritocracy, uh, that the priorities make sense and they get things done. And when you look at Pew and Edelman polls, they basically say the same thing. So uh, I'm always a little surprised when I hear individuals say, I like the Chinese people, but not the government, uh, because it doesn't seem to me, at least based on my own experience, where the people actually are with respect to the government. And it's not that they, consistently agree with everything the government does, but they are so far from the picture painted in the US of evil empire that I just wonder if there isn't credibility behind the issue of the Chinese people are genuinely unhappy because it's just so oh. far out of yeah. sync with what I yeah. see it here. Thank well, you. Uh, there's Sorry. a lot of uh, uh, truth in what you've said. I think uh, a lot of Chinese people, if not more than 50%, if not more than 75%, are actually quite proud of where their country has come from. But whether they attribute that to the Communist Party or not is a much more debatable issue. Uh, and uh, certainly China, to paint China as an evil empire is a caricature. Uh, I would say that only a very small group of people outside China would uh, uh, put that label on China. And uh, I don't think, I will be in that camp. I don't think Liz is that in camp. A lot of credible mainstream China scholars would not say China is an evil empire. China has a lot of problems. China's conduct has a lot of problems. We don't agree with that. We think it's quite counterproductive, if not self-destructive. But this said, I would want, just want to refer to those polls. Polling out of China is very problematic because they look at questions, they, look, they, can, uh, they make it very hard for you to get a randomized sample. Uh, so you really don't know uh, uh, what people think. And uh, uh, so that's why I, uh, I tend to sort of uh, uh, believe in the stories I read in the Chinese press about the feelings of the Chinese system uh, rather than looking at the polls. I wanna make one other point on this, which is and to, to Minchin's point about, you know, maybe the majority of the Chinese people are very proud of how far China has come, proud of where, how China stands on the global stage, right? That China you know, is now a great power on the global stage, but many may also not be happy with the more repressive political turn uh, that China has taken. I mean, I think we can all look across many US administrations and say, maybe I liked this one or two, one or two things about what they were doing, but I didn't like all these other things that they were doing. And so I don't think we can even just paint China as, you know, you know, the people support it wholly. They may support some aspects of it and some not. And you can look, I think, after the death of Dr. Li Wenliang, what took place, right, the whistleblower uh, uh, in the early stage of COVID, look at what happened on the internet in those few moments when there was some openness, right, you had all these people calling for free speech, right? And criticizing the government. Now, of course, all those people have now been arrested, not all of them, but <laughs> they hunted them down, of course, and all those yeah. journalists who went to try to reveal the truth of what was going on. Um, but I, I guess I point to that just as an example of like, you can see or look in the pre-she period when the internet was so alive, 
right? With there were environmental protest calls for even political reform. It was a very different, you know, political space in China at the time when I think intellectuals, entrepreneurs, and others had much greater range to speak freely without fear, you know, of what happened to say Renzi Chan, right? In prison for 18 years because, you know, he called Xi Jinping, what, an emperor with no clothes or a clown or something like that. So I think um, it's hard to know in a system that doesn't enable, it doesn't permit freedom of speech, really to know what the Chinese people are, are thinking. Thanks. Um a lot of questions on themes. I'm going to try to group them and I'm aware of time, but let me open it up to Watanabe Yusuke, who was a journalist based in China for um, 11 years. Uh, uh, what, Ms. Watanabe, are you there? There we go. You can yes, unmute sir? Mr. Sorry. Uh, yes. Um, I was surprised how uh, Mr. Mishipe's hair got white. Oh, yeah. in, well, I'm old <laughs> in the past 20 years. I'm, I was just wondering, you know, uh, what kind of roles that uh, the country like Japan play in this uh, tense Sino US relations? Uh, what kind of, let's say, uh, constructive role that we can play in the relationship? Thank you. Thank you. You're asking me or asking Liz? Liz, why don't you go ahead? Because you need to, you need to leave in uh, three minutes. Um, so look, I think um, Japan is playing a very important role in many respects. Um, Japan is a really important source of investment in Southeast Asia, for example. It is more popular in the region than the United States or China. Generally speaking, when you look at the polls about like, does who does the region want to lead? It's neither the US nor nor, nor uh, China it tends to be Japan. Um, I like from the perspective of the United States, Japan is you know, one of our strongest allies. Uh, and so uh, whether we're talking about you know, the quad or the bilateral relationship, um, I mean, I think we have uh, you know, developed um, a strong economic and, and military uh, relationship and certainly political over the past decade or more. Um, you know, one of our most trusted partners you know, globally. So, um, you know, I think it, it, speaking from the US, I, I, don't, I don't think there's, you know, much, um, you know, much concern about uh, the role of Japan. Um, and Japan is, you know, we're playing with Japan in the tech space and supply chains. Um, you know, Japan has, you know, put forward a number of, of I think, important initiatives uh, in terms of reshoring and trend shoring. Uh, I don't know, there's, I, I think, when I, when I consider, you know, the relationship between Japan and the United States, um, I think it's a very robust one. Um, and, you know, I think perhaps the most significant shift I've seen in just the recent months is Japan's decision to, you know, step up to the plate and say that Taiwan's security uh, is tied to Japan's security. And, you know, I think that is a, a really uh, significant shift um, in how Japan um, has, uh, uh, you know, is approaching regional security. Um, the last point I'll make is I, I do think that, you know, Japan has also played a really important role in Africa, um, you know, along with India. Um, you know, Japan can play in many spaces in a, in a do, I think, uh, you know, in terms of high quality infrastructure and other things, things the United States would like to do. The United States has a lot more baggage, sometimes doesn't have the same capabilities. Um, and so in that regard, as a, as a standard bearer, as a democracy, and as a provider of, you know, high quality uh, infrastructure and good governance, I think is really important. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very conscious of the time. There's lots, lots more questions, as you can imagine. Many of them broadly groped into things like technology and artificial intelligence, some about Taiwan. Um, Liz, I'm very aware. I just saw the little thing went beep, 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 and I know you have to go on a call. Um, if it's okay, maybe Minshin, will you stay on with us for another five so minutes? We can take a few more questions. Okay. Uh, because I know that you have to. So a big thank right, you, Liz. wait, Liz, before you go one more time. I absolutely <laughs> encourage. Okay. Thanks so much, we, James. Appreciate no, 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 no. Because you know we've you've kept the captured the imagination of the people on here for the past hour, and you know we can't do it justice in forty five minutes or sixty minutes here. And it's a primer and it's for everybody. And, and as Minshin said, it's joyful to read. So I encourage everybody to, to really get a copy. 
just don't take it too close to bedtime because you won't fall asleep. It's captivating. <laughs> so thank you for joining us, Liz. And if you don't mind mentioning, we'll stay on and take one or two more okay. questions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again, Liz. So um, some of them are about um, Taiwan, but I just wanted to open up one or two, some about technology. And then, and then of course, we'll try to wrap things up on time. Um, Mubarak Ali has asked some questions. Maybe um, Mubarak, you can come on, introduce yourself and um, ask your question. Uh, good morning, sir. I'm Mubarak Ali from India. Uh, thanks for your invaluable insight. Extending my sincere thanks to organizer for this opportunity. Uh, my question is, Beijing is head of global dominance because of its advancement in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and cyber capabilities. What are the merits and demerits to the world? Will you please kindly share your view on it, sir? And thanks for the opportunity. Did you catch that mention? No, no, I... I, I didn't. Did you? So if you can. Beijing is headed for global dominance because no, of the no. in artificial <laughs> yeah. intelligence, no. machine learning, and cyber capabilities. Yeah, I, uh, I think there's a lot of hype about Chinese capabilities. I think so far, uh, the US is still uh, significantly ahead. If you look at scientific publications, uh, where the talent is located, where the key technologies are being developed, where the more fundamental breakthroughs are being made. Of course, China is a quite significant player, but the US is uh, squarely ahead. Uh, and also uh, science and technology uh, cannot be uh, grown uh, inside a completely locked sort of insulated country. You need global uh, collaboration. Uh, and the US is the place where global collaboration takes place. So I think, uh, uh, China obviously would like to dominate, but uh, the likelihood that China will succeed is still pretty small. Thank you. Um, and then the last bit, maybe you can just help us think through a couple of things. There's been quite a few questions around Taiwan. And, um, you know, I think that for those of us who follow China, I think we believe that um, China now is very steely minded about its desire for reunification that it's just a question of time, not when. Perhaps the people living on Taiwan don't see the same, see it the same way. Um, but I, I guess to sum up the questions is, what's the appropriate response from America? How should America address this issue? And how should we think about it? Yeah, it's hard. Uh, it's almost an impossible uh, issue. What has kept Taiwan straight? peaceful for the last 50 years. This is actually the months uh, when, uh, well, 50 years ago this month, Nixon went to China and signed the Shanghai Communique, which laid the foundation uh, of so-called One China policy that kept the peace. Now One China policy is on life support. So the challenge for the US and China uh, and to much less extent Taiwan is to work out a political, new political framework that will be acceptable to three sides. Right now, we have a very dangerous dynamic. That's a dynamic toward military confrontation with completely catastrophic, uh, catastrophic consequences. Uh, so uh, that is not a pass you want to go down to. But unfortunately, the three sides, China, Taiwan, the US, are all going down that path. I think they all they should stop and see, can there be a political solution to restoring a framework that will make, that will maintain peace? That's all I can say. <laughs> and do you think such a framework exists? Is there one? No, oh, it, it can be done, but then it requires uh, concessions from three sides. Uh, I don't see the conditions uh, there yet. Uh, most likely you're going to have a huge crisis. Everybody will be at the brink. They look down and say, well, we don't want to go there. Then they will step back and look for that. So <laughs> uh, I just hope when they are at that brink, they don't make a step forward. Mm, okay. Um, you know, we could go on all night. I promised people we would keep on time. Um, but I, I, I do want to say in, so just in the closing, um, 
engagement. Th thank you for your time, Minshin. I didn't have a chance to, to thank Liz. Thank okay. you so much for spending a evening with us this evening and helping to illuminate and shed light on, 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 on a bit of what's going on and encourage people to look forward. In fact, the gentleman who just talked about technology, you have a book coming up on surveillance and technology. So uh, keep an eye out for, for that. Um, but I do think no matter whether we like it or not, China is rising on the planet. And it behooves every one of us to try to more deeply understand um, how they're thinking, what their motives are, and you know how 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 a billion 1.4 billion people are, are moving forward. And I hope that at China Institute we can give people access to authentic voices coming from China. I encourage you to log on, whether you take a class with us, whether you participate in our programs, whether you come and see some of the artwork that's coming through in our ex exhibitions at China Institute that all of you will recognize how important a role China plays in the shared future of this planet. And it's too important a relationship for us as Americans um, not to pay attention to it. So I want to say thank you again to Minchin, to Dinda and to Aaron, and to everyone that has participated this evening. I hope to see you frequently joining our programs and wish you a, a lovely evening. Thanks again. Okay. Bye.